Hello everybody, welcome back to another Pandora Hearts discussion video. This time I am on volume number 21. Only three more volumes left in the Pandora Hearts manga series. Now, for those of you that watch these videos regularly, and I know there's maybe about a hundred of you that do, um, now would be a great time to start suggesting series that I could continue doing these videos with. I'm looking to read a manga series that's, I'd say, less than 30 to 25 volumes. It doesn't have to be like a max. It can be 5, 10, 15, 20. I just don't really want to get anything longer than, you know, around 25, because otherwise I end up doing these videos for years. <laughs> and I'd like to do maybe like two series a year if I can handle that. So if you know a series that sort of fits the bill that you think you'd like me to flap my lips about for a while, then by all means, please leave those suggestions down in the comments. I'd really appreciate it. Uh, the only series that I'm going to say no to is Jun Mochizuki's new series. Um, what is it? The Case of Veritas? I can't remember. But because I've already done a Mochizuki with uh, Pandora Hearts, I just want to do a different author, different art style. So anything other than another Mochizuki title, and again, anything that's about less than 30 to 25 volumes, just because, uh, yeah, I don't want it to go too long. We don't want to be doing like Bleach or, you know, One Piece where I have to do these videos for the next 10 years. So with that said, again, spoilers ahead for volume number 21, as well as all the volumes before it. And I have not read ahead, so I have no idea what's going to happen beyond this volume other than what I'm guessing at. So let's get into it. So this volume, it was kind of interesting. So last volume, of course, we had sort of Oscar's heart laid bare, okay? So we had Uncle Oscar. We finally kind of found out what his motivations and inner feelings have been, especially towards Oz and towards Gil. We got a very good sense of just who Oscar was, both his sort of tortured negatives as well as his just overwhelming positives that, man, just made his end so much harder. Now, this volume, we have a focus on Duke Barma, which is obviously very appropriate given the fact that he did this, you know, complete turnaround on Pandora, betrayed them to the Baskervilles, has been basically preaching to the Pandora operatives about the truth of Jack Vesalius to turn Pandora against Oz and to turn them to the side of the Baskervilles. So it only makes sense that we had to find out what his real motivations were because anybody who believed that it was just the whole, well, I figured they were going to win, so I want to be on the winning side, Way too easy, way too simple for somebody like Barma. And sure enough, that's exactly what we get in this. We find out way too simple. In fact, I have to admit, I read this a couple times just to try to, like, scratch my head going, wow, like, was there not an easier way of kind of doing all this? Like, I just... But I'm getting ahead of myself. So we open up on this volume, and of course, Oz, Alice, and Gil are safe. We do find out, confirmed, that Oscar is gone. I had some hopes, but, well, Zy Vesalius is a bastard. I was pretty sure he would have pulled the trigger anyway, so I can't say I really had a lot of high hopes. But, you know, you never know, right? Manga, anime, all that kind of stuff. Sometimes, 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 the, the predictable, it doesn't happen. But this time, yeah, pretty much it did. And we find out that they've actually escaped to Lutwidge Academy. And that's where the whole Lucas Gate led them. And they have been rescued by all people by Rhyme. Now, Rhyme is, says that he kind of questions whether Duke Barma's truly betrayed everyone. Because it was Duke Barma that dispatched him to the school to look and watch for the exit from Lucas Gate. Almost as if he anticipated that Oz and company would be escaping. Now, there's sort of simultaneously two other storylines going on here. So we have Duke Barma, Vincent, and Glenn, who are, of course, going to Sablier. And then we have Brake, Sharon, and Cheryl, who are still at Pandora and being held by the Baskervilles and are currently powerless and unable to fight back. So we're left with all these people in peril. So what happens? Well... It gets a little bit convoluted to me, like, 
I mean, I think the thing that made it most clear was when Ryan was having that discussion with Oz, where Oz, or no, it was Gil, I guess, who was trying to sort of say, like, oh, yeah, of course, Barm is a traitor, blah, blah, blah. And Ryan is like, well, if he hadn't turned over Pandora the way that he did, wouldn't more people have died? And, of course, you know, Gil can't really argue it, because, yeah, that's probably true. And, you know, then he's like, but he almost killed Cheryl. And he's like, well, thing is, he could have killed Cheryl. Like, he totally had the ability to... But he didn't. If he hadn't sort of put her down, wouldn't the Baskervilles have truly finished her off and killed her? By making her injured and powerless, didn't he in effect save her life? And the same thing with Break, and the same thing with Sharon, that by rendering them powerless, didn't he save their lives? So, okay, well, yeah, you know, like, I kind of get this, all right. So he makes a pretty good argument that you know, maybe, maybe, maybe Duke Barb has got these sort of ulterior motives. And, well, let, ah, so much, so much. So, we go through sort of a convoluted thing where, you know, Rhyme sort of is like, well, we should explore the school because we know that Duke Barma came here and he gave me this key and it must mean something. And Oz pipes up and is like, well... The Baskervilles have hidden passages, and we know that the Baskervilles were tied to Lutwidge Academy at one point, so maybe it's a secret passage. So Ryman sort of like says to the headmaster who's there, he's like, okay, tell me, you know, you were here when Duke Barmo was here. Did he explore? Would he have known about these hidden passages? And so they go off to try and find it. And sure enough, they end up finding this secret room in sort of the catacombs, and isn't there a page boy of the Barma house there with this box full of letters that he's been entrusted with by Duke Barma? Long story short, it turns out that at first glance they look like they're just love letters from Cheryl. Well, maybe not so much love letters per se, but letters from Cheryl. And there's actually a cipher, a, a sort of a, a hidden code that Rhyme begins to sort of decode as we go along. Meanwhile, Glenn is entirely suspicious of Duke Barma and is pressing him to tell him, you know, what really is your intentions and everything else. And then there's like a sort of a cave-in or like some rocks fall down. Duke Barma is injured and Glenn immediately attacks him and he's like, why didn't you use your chain? And Duke Barma is like, well, my chain was injured because it was fighting the Mad Hatter, blah, blah, blah. And Glenn's like, you're full of it. You know, you staged that, really convenient for all of us, but I think it's really that you can't use your chain. And we find out that when Duke Barma made it appear that he had destroyed the Rainsworth keys, that in reality he had destroyed his own key, and he had done it just as a way to make them believe that he had destroyed the Rainsworth keys, but in reality... Because he possessed the Rainsworth key, he was able to basically suppress their powers. And then he sends it with this page boy, who then once, you know, Rhyme puts it all together, he figures out, holy crap, like, this pendant is the true Rainsworth key. So basically, Rhyme realizes, like, the right of ownership doesn't belong to the Rainsworths. It doesn't even belong to Duke Barma. Like, somehow, it's been removed. And so he figures out sort of this process. He goes, you know, this should at least give me the right to release the hold that's been put on the chains of the Rainsworth house. And so he does so, and we are treated to several pages of break-kicking ass. You know, big mistake, Baskervilles, given that backhand to Sharon, because, man, break does not even start to forgive with that one. It is all out Massacre City. And then, of course, when Cheryl pipes in and she's like, yeah, break, I'm going to help you out. And she turns the whole place into dark and eliminates like everything. And break just wipes everybody else because he's he's blind. He doesn't need his eyes. Whereas, you know, when you've got your sight, you rely so much on it that he basically mops up the floor and there's only a couple of Baskervilles left alive. And in the midst of all of this, these remaining Baskervilles are saved by Zway. 
or Zwei, or I can never, I don't know, Rame and Rhyme and Zwei and Zwei and I. If there's any German speakers, please help me out because I'm not too sure how EI is supposed to be in German. I believe it's I, but if I'm wrong, I apologize. But, but Zwei shows up and he, of course, has taken over. He's suppressed Echo deep inside, if not obliterated, or it's kind of left a little bit nebulous about exactly what happened to the Echo persona. But basically, he grabs the uh, he grabs Zy Vasilius and has him summon Griffin, and he boards Griffin. He's holding Ada captive, and then he gets Lottie and Lily on board, and they take off to Sablier. We go back to Lutwich Academy, and Oz is coming to this realization that, you know what? We need to go to Sablier. And Duke Barma's ultimate proclamation, what are you doing all this for? And his answer is love. Because he loves Cheryl so much, and has wanted to marry her for so long, that... He's risking everything because if the world as it exists is obliterated like Glenn is planning to do, then it means he'll never have met her. It means they'll never have shared any of their time together. And he just cannot abide by that. And this is a really great thing. Like, for a character, and I mean, it shouldn't surprise me because it kind of was the same way with Oscar, right? Like, with Oscar, up to this point, you know, last volume, we were kind of led to believe that Oscar just had this really big heart and he, he was happy-go-lucky, chased after the girls, everything else. But we find out that at his core, it's his heartbreak that defines him as a character. And that this whole, like, happy-go-lucky thing is essentially something that he is projected because he doesn't want to cause harm to others. We realize that initially... Him being with Oz causes him torture. But that eventually he comes to see Oz and friends truly as his family. Well, we have sort of the same idea with Duke Barma. Up to this point, we've been led to believe that Duke Barma is a creature entirely driven by logic and by secrets and information. That everything that he does is so that he can get more information. And that knowledge to him is the ultimate goal and desire. That's what we've been led to believe. But in truth, this character then turns around and proclaims that love, his desire to marry Cheryl, is actually what drives him. That knowledge isn't his goal, it's his weapon. It's his way of trying to control and manipulate things towards his own favor. And again, now we have this character who has now been made a bit more multidimensional. And I think that any other character probably in this series proclaiming that love was their driving force might have been a little cheesy. But when you have a character who seemed to have been driven so much just by cold calculation, it, it doesn't come across, actually. Like I said, it, it actually deepens the character and makes him more interesting and even him he makes that statement that that was the one thing that separated him from Isla Yura that the fact that Isla Yura cared for nothing he loved nothing all he wanted was just to know and to know all the things and for him there was nothing behind it no heart no passion so even Duke Barma is actually now criticizing the way that we've interpreted this character for the majority of the series. And then, of course, just like Oscar, because, you know, how can we have a secondary character suddenly be featured, be given depth and interesting characteristics, and have him live? Like, there's just, there's just no way. Although this, this death, I will say, is a little bit more nebulous than Oscar's. I mean, I kind of get the feeling that Duke Barma won't be back from this, but... Who knows? I mean, he let himself fall off a cliff rather than get hacked up by Glenn. So, I mean, I guess, you know, die on your own terms, be killed. Like, I guess, you know, okay. I, I get what, again, it's that cold logic part of him, right? But 
The fact that you have a body, you don't have a body. The, the fact that he plunges into darkness. It could go either way. Like, I can see this being either, yes, he's truly dead, or he's going to show up all of a sudden out of nowhere, all battered and broken, but yet still somewhat alive. Wouldn't surprise me if he saves the day somehow, or saves Cheryl, or who knows. Like, I, I just, I, I do kind of have this little buzzing in the back of my head that says we haven't quite seen the end of Duke Barma yet. Could be completely wrong on that one, but we'll see what the last remaining volumes hold. Now, once, of course, Duke Barma is out of the way, we have Glenn and Vincent left alone. Now, I recall, like before, I said that Vincent... I thought that Vincent would be the key for Oz and company to chase Glenn through time. Because... Vincent's powers as a child of ill omen would probably allow him passage in a special way through the abyss. As it turns out, I was kind of half right on this one. So Vincent's not really helping Oz and company, he's actually helping Glenn. In fact, Glenn says to him, he's like, do you still want to disappear? And this is kind of an interesting thing because Glenn says that he was told that by Leo, uh, because Vincent's like, you know, how do you know that? Did you pry that information out of Leo? And he's like, no, I, I can't force him. We wouldn't have individual in identities if we could force things out of each other. He's like, he volunteered the information to me, and he's just watching. So this, to me, I thought was kind of interesting, because I thought, well... Does that mean Leo still has the ability to assert himself? Like, could he still come forward and challenge Glenn for control of himself? Well, I guess it's Oswald Glenn that he would be fighting. But you know what I mean? Like, does he have that ability, that capability still? Because it does sound as though they still retain individual identities. And it's like they're accessing information. So the information of the former Glens is there, and so is their personality, but it's the owner of the host, the newest host, that asserts their own identity. But now Leo's been subserved, he's become subservient to Oswald. So I kind of wonder if that's how things are going to sort of change. I kind of wonder if Leo is going to come out at some point. I mean, again... It's one of those things that we'll have to see, but certainly with that statement, they kind of leave the door open for that possibility, right? And, of course, we also now know that Brake and company, once they've kind of survived their ordeal, they're going to come to Sablier too. So, all of our players are coming to Sablier. We're setting the stage. And at the end of this volume, there's an earthquake unlike any other usual earthquake... And the city of Sablier has once again risen from the pit. And there's this city <laughs> all of a sudden that wasn't there before. And I kind of, like, I was kind of curious about that. Because to me, I thought, well, is that just like a phantom thing? Because Glenn says he's going to go through to the past, right? He's going to visit the past. So... Is this city appearing because Glenn has gone to the past and already started meddling and so the world is starting to change? Or is this kind of like the abyss? It's like if part of the present goes into the past, part of the past comes into the present. Like, you know what I mean? Like, sort of a cyclical thing? Or, I don't know, or maybe this is just some kind of enhancement of that whole odd temporal interference? Like... We know that when you go into Sablier, there's the phantoms of the past. And I kind of wonder if maybe this is sort of a more fanciful, fanciful version of those phantoms. It's like a whole city now. So I don't know how that's going to play out. Um, and, I, and I really don't know what it means. I don't, like I said, I don't know if it means that the world, the past has already started changing and so the world is changing too. Or whether it is just sort of like a side effect of them going through the gate. So the stage is now set. We have all of our players moving into a single location. 
We have Oz, who has basically overcome the influence of Jack, or at least that's certainly what it seems to suggest, and maybe even in control of the Bee Rabbit's powers, like, willingly without it being a problem. So, that could be cool. But at least he's sort of released the whole shackles of, you know, questioning his existence and sort of denying himself as a person. He's Instead, he's embraced himself and he's embraced who he is and his identity. And certainly the way that Jack crumbled away into dust at the end of the last volume kind of suggests to me that that's his way of escaping from Jack's influence. And I, I kind of think that's the end of Jack. Like, I, I at least... I mean, if we end up in the past, I guess we'll see Jack at some point or somehow, but but I think that's the end of Jack's influence of Oz. I mean, certainly there was nothing in this volume that would suggest that Jack's psyche or soul or influence or whatever you want to call it was still in Oz. Like, there was no evidence of that whatsoever. In fact, what I find is kind of funny is that, I mean, as I'm sitting here looking at how long I've been talking... This volume, like after last volume and all the emotional impact and all the different twists and the reveals and everything else, this volume is probably one of the most straight ahead volumes that I think we've had in a while. I mean, it was pretty clear cut. We had the three storylines. They each had a fairly linear sort of development to them. They all had sort of like a singular goal. So the goal of the Oz storyline, of course, was to discover that Duke Barma was not a traitor and for Oz to sort of come to that final realization that, you know what, despite all the crap that has happened, I value this life, I value these friends, and I want to fight for it and I don't want to allow it to change. So we have that sort of storyline. We have, you know, the storyline with Vincent and with Glenn and with Barma being sort of the reveal of Barma's intentions, which... When it all boils down to it is, boy's got mad love for Cheryl. <laughs> he coordinated this whole thing to reduce bloodshed and to try and hook up with Cheryl. <laughs> so that's kind of what that all boiled down to. And then, you know, of course, just Glenn and Vincent afterwards progressing forward to try and go to the past. And then we have, of course, our Sharon, Cheryl, and Break. And they were weak. Now they're not. There were lots of Baskervilles, and now there's not. <laughs> and that's pretty much that storyline. Like I said, a lot of sort of panels in this devoted to uh, Barma and Cheryl's relationship, and also to a lot of action, which is cool, because, you know, we've had a lot of really great character development and stuff, but we haven't had a lot of sword action scenes in a while, so it was cool to see that happen and I just you know break is one of those characters that when he just lets loose it is just so much fun and I really love that part of it and seeing him unleash on these people especially when he says to you know Sharon where did they hit you <laughs> like I just yeah I, I do enjoy break I mean I know he's got this kind of horrible past but yeah whatever he's still an awesome character and I thought it was really cool to sort of see him back in action so those are my thoughts on volume number 21 of Pandora Hearts. Uh, if I've missed anything or there's any other things that you want to discuss, by all means, put it down in the comments below. That would be fantastic. I always love being able to chat with all of you about this great manga series. And again, I've only got three volumes left. So if you've got a suggestion for a series that's about 25 to 30 volumes completed... Uh, by all means, please leave that in the comments. I'm going to take a look at them and see if there's one that kind of piques my interest. And I will start doing this same kind of series with a new manga after, well, in about four weeks' time. So again, thank you so much for watching the video. I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Until then, bye-bye for now.